Good morning, everybody. Great to see everybody this morning. Welcome to Grand Rounds. We're going to go ahead and get started. It's my uh, distinguished pleasure this morning to introduce you to Dr. Rachel Berger, who is a guest from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and is a guest of our uh, Dr. Alicia Kirsch this morning. So Dr. Berger um, is the division chief of uh, the Division of Child Advocacy at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. She's also the director of child abuse research. She's had a very productive and successful research career with over 100 peer-reviewed publications and several uh, uh, textbook chapters as well. Her research interests are in child abuse and uh, abuse of head trauma. And uh, it's great to have Dr. Berger this morning. Welcome. Thank you, Micah. So it's a little bit of like a reunion for me because um, David Adelson was one of my original mentors in Pittsburgh, and I was telling Mike on the way here that I feel really, really lucky because not every neurosurgeon would have a general academic pediatrician as one of their mentees. So I said, I've always been very indebted to David's mentorship, and Danny Brown, I've work, worked with at Pittsburgh for many, many years, um, is part of our research. So I said, this is like a mini reunion for me. Um, so today I'm going to use serum biomark talk about serum biomarkers and clinical decision support as ways to improve detection of abusive head trauma. There we go. Okay, so today we're going to talk about why this is an important problem, what are the barriers to identification of abusive head trauma, talk a little bit about um, electronic health record embedded clinical decision support as one way to improve abusive head trauma identification, and then talk quite a bit about the pathway from bench to bedside for serum biomarkers to be used in conjunction with clinical decision support on their own um, or as a, basically as another way to improve detection of abusive head trauma. So they asked me to start with a multiple choice question, which um, we'll kind of drive what we're going to talk about. Um, which of the following strategies have been evaluated to improve detection of abusive head trauma? Um, the Pittsburgh Infant Brain Injury Score, Universal Child Abuse Screening, Electronic Health Record Embedded Child Abuse Clinical Decision Support, Biomarkers of Brain, Infant Brain Injury Score, and Brain Injury Screen Fast MRI. So you're supposed to select all that apply at the end. So I want to start by talking a little bit about abusive head trauma. So it is the leading cause of death from physical abuse, the leading cause of death from traumatic brain injury in young children. And people have really thought about this as the low-lying fruit of primary prevention in child abuse because if you want to decrease death from child abuse, you need to decrease a death from abusive head trauma. Unfortunately, this really hasn't been as easy as people would like it to do. We've invested lots of money in prevention programs, um, and we really haven't consistently seen an improvement. Another way to decrease death is to improve early diagnosis because many of the children who die, it is not their first episode of abusive head trauma. So our approach really over the last 20 years has not been on primary prevention, but on how do we detect abusive head trauma earlier when it's more mild, or even better yet, detect the child who has a fracture before they have the abusive head trauma since we often know that violence escalates and use that as a way to decrease death from abusive head trauma. The risk of severe or fatal abuse of head trauma is about 1 in 3,300. Just to buy a comparison, the risk of acute um, or ALL for any in every child under the age of 18 is about 1 in 30,000, so much more common than that, but about the same, for example, as type 1 diabetes, which is actually quite similar, about 1 in 2,600. Um, mild abuse of head trauma we know is much more common, which isn't surprising. I mean, all types of traumatic brain injury, 90% of it is going to be mild. There was a very nice study done by Theodore and his colleagues in North Carolina. When people used to have um, home phones, they used random digit dialing, and about 1% to 2% of parents said they had shaken their baby out of frustration. Now, clearly all those children did not have abusive head trauma, but it just gives you a sense that this is an action that sometimes parents do when they are frustrated. So conservatively, we have about 2,000 cases a year in the U.S. There are lots of names for abusive head trauma. I'm going to stick to abusive head trauma. That's the term the American P uh, Academy of Pediatrics has kind of coined. But the long time, the NIH used an inflicted childhood neurotrauma. The NIH used, the uh, CDC used intentional traumatic brain injury. These are other things. They're all the same event. Although I would say shaken baby syndrome is really a subset of abusive head trauma because not all. All babies that are shaken have abusive head trauma, but not all children with abusive head trauma were shaken because you can have an impact that's abusive as well. So I'm going to use abusive head trauma, but said all these are the same. So we know that even the best physician miss abusive head trauma. The landmark paper was done by Carol Jenny and her colleagues at Denver Children's, published in JAMA in 1999, and they looked at 173 children in Denver Children's ER who were diagnosed with abusive head trauma, and they found that 31% of those kids had been seen previously in their institution and misdiagnosed. 
quite a few of those kids were re-injured between the two, the misdiagnosis. There were quite a few medical complications, and they said four of the five deaths were clearly preventable, but basically an injured child had been sent back to a caretaker who was clearly had anger issues. So if you return an infant with abusive head trauma to a violent home, they are at high risk of being re-injured or killed. They also noted that the children who were most likely to be missed were white, had a milder presentation, which makes sense, because if you come in in cardiac arrest, you're gonna get a head CT, right? But the more mild ones were not, and married parents, and the children were also younger, which also makes sense, because the neurologic exam becomes less sensitive the younger the child is. And I highlighted this in red because the issue of race, improving detection, and decreasing bias is something that's gonna come up a few times. So unfortunately, after that paper, there was a lot of um, push to educate physicians about abusive head trauma um, and child abuse in general. And then 15 years later, we basically intentionally repeated the same study done by Carol Jenny and her colleagues as part of the Abusive Head Trauma Consortium, which is a consortium of four children's hospitals established actually to look at the influence or the relationship between the economy and abusive head trauma. But there were four or five pre-planned sub-studies and this was one of them. So exactly 15 years after Carol Jenny, we had 232 children from four institutions um, with abusive head trauma and the prior opportunities was virtually identical, so 32%. We were able to do a couple other things and actually show that if you had a missed opportunity, you're more likely to have healing fractures, chronic subdurals, to actually demonstrate that these were missed opportunities. And the most common prior opportunities, not surprisingly, were children who presented with nonspecific signs and symptoms, which really could have been anything, but actually turned out to be child abuse, vomiting, bruising, another abusive injury, seizure and fussiness, which are things we're gonna talk about. And the most common opportunities occurred in an ED and PCP offices, which is not uncommon because that's where children are being seen. Of note though, this is, if you remember before, we really had urgent care centers and the, the um, increase of urgent care centers for care of young, young children, I think has actually made this problem much worse because most of those providers are not pediatric providers and don't even think about trauma in an infant with vomiting. So I said it might actually be worse now, but in this context before urgent care centers, this was what we saw. So this was a little depressing. Um, and so the, the, we have to step back and say, okay, we, clearly education alone did not work. So why are we missing abusive head trauma? I think one is lack of knowledge. Um, I said, we know the, what the data say. We know which injuries a three-month-old with a bruise should raise the concern for physical abuse, should raise the concern for abusive head trauma. And there are pretty good guidelines from the American Academy of Pediatrics. We know, though, clinical guidelines alone don't change practice. I think the other thing we're always faced with is child abuse is rare. I mean, it's more common than we'd like, but it's a rare disease. And it's not as rare as cancer, but it's rarer than most everything else people see in an ED or a PCP office, particularly a general ED, probably not a level one trauma center pediatric ED, but a general ED. And I think the field of child abuse pediatrics has changed a lot in 10 years. Um, I was just saying to Micah that, you know, I did not do a child abuse fellowship. We didn't have one. When the boards came in 2009, I grandfathered to take the boards and I literally sat with books and learned everything about sexual abuse because I only did physical abuse and neglect and I had to learn all this stuff. Now, the, the the um, amount of data and information about child abuse has expanded tremendously. And we have a three-year fellowship. You have to do a three-year fellowship to be boarded. And I don't think there's any way now that someone could just come in and know what the knowledge base is. So I think part of the problem is we now have so much more knowledge, but people generally are not getting CMEs in child abuse. So the knowledge base is expanding, but people are not having very much education. I think the thing we always have to recognize is it's really hard to believe that adults hurt children. And fundamentally, I think that is a barrier to detection of abuse. The idea that someone would hurt their on, own child that would hurt a five-month-old, I think that's hard. And so sometimes people kind of put it out of their mind because they want to believe what the person in front of them is saying. So we're always taught the history is the key. The parent knows their child best. But in child abuse, you have to throw that out and the history is almost never correct. And sometimes it's because the person telling you the history doesn't know, or sometimes because they're being deceptive. But it's antithetical to everything we learn as physicians in how to take a history. I think there are unconscious biases. People have ideas about who might abuse their child and who won't. Um, and I think at our core, we are pediatricians and we don't wanna hurt people. And when we diagnose or even suspect abuse, we are causing pain to people. And that is a really hard thing to do. And it's very hard to think in your mind, I'm doing this because in the end, I want to make this family better. But I think that that gut feeling is I don't want to hurt people. So I think we have to remember that that is one of the issues here. So 
And then I think the issue is it's not always just lack of knowledge. Even if you have all the knowledge in the world, it is hard to identify. So we don't have a history. The symptoms such as vomiting, irritability, fussiness, they're completely nonspecific. And they're obviously more likely not to be due to abusive head trauma. And of course, young children with even bad brain injuries can look well. So we can't use our neurologic exam. So I think these three together make detecting abusive head trauma, and I would say even broader physical abuse, very difficult. So what can we do? So I think the first question is, if we want to try to improve identification, who should we be screening? When should we be screening? And what do we need to look for in any type of screening tool? So who do we miss? As I mentioned, we miss young children. I said, kids that are three or four, or two, you know, they sometimes say to me what happened. So it's not hard to diagnose because somebody tells you what happened. So the younger children, the ones who cannot talk, are the ones we really need to think about abuse. And severity of symptoms. The children with the mild symptoms are the ones we're most likely to miss. I said, we don't need to screen children who are covered in bruises because we know we need to look for child abuse. And when do you screen? So I think when children have signs and symptoms that could be abuse, that's when we screen. Or importantly, when they have other injuries due to abuse. So in our general EDs, one of the things we see is they have an infant with a bruise. And they might do a skeletal survey, they might do a baby gram, or they have a three month old, they might do those. It never occurs to them to get brain imaging. Right, so even though they're thinking, they think, oh, the child looks neurologically fine. So we have an opportunity, we have a three month old with a bruise, but we have to make that next step and ensure that they're getting some type of brain injury, a brain screen. So how do we choose a test? Obviously we want a very sensitive test because we don't want to miss cases. And we want a specific test because you don't want to screen too many children to find a case of abusive head trauma. I would argue this is not about specificity in terms of diagnosing abuse because none of these tests are diagnosing abuse. All they're doing is identifying an intracranial hemorrhage and then you need to go through the process of determining whether that's abuse. And I was gonna show you in the study there are many other reasons why children might have a brain injury when they're an infant that is unrelated to abusive head trauma. And of course the acceptable specificity depends on the screening tool, but the risk of the follow-up diagnostic is also really important. And I'm gonna talk about that as it relates to fast MRI, because you can do, develop a screening tool. If the test done when that screening tool is positive is a head CT that has fairly significant radiation risk, it's a different, a, you need a different accuracy of your screening tool than if the follow-up test is a fast brain MRI that doesn't require radiation or sedation. Right, so we have to remember that things will change as to what's an acceptable sensitivity and specificity depending on what that follow-up test is gonna be. So here's the scenario that I think I've shown every time I talk about what we're trying to do. Because I think this shows you all we have is we have a high-risk child, we have a high-risk scenario. If we miss abuse, that's bad. And then we wanna develop some armamentarium of screening tools that allows us to give you the diagnostic test which tells you whether the child has an intracranial hemorrhage. Again, it's not whether the child has abuse, but whether they have a brain injury. So let's start with the broadest possible screening tool. What about embedding child abuse clinical decision support to identify all forms of maltreatment and then look at abusive head trauma as one of the you know, added benefits of doing that? So this is a, a paper that we publish in Jamia, which is like the um, Journal for Medical Informatics. And it talks about how we developed an electronic, an EHR-based system to identify physical abuse. So Cerner is our EHR, um, and so that's what we used. And our focus was physical abuse, partly because, as I'm gonna show you, that's what you can easily pick up in the medical record. It's something that we see as physicians. Most neglect, for example, never touches us. Sexual abuse, we don't really see in young, young children. So that's why we decided to focus on physical abuse. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we did. The stuff in gray is I'm not gonna talk about, but we did. First, you always perform a usability evaluation. You, any kind of electronic clinical decision support needs to fit into your workflow. I'm not gonna talk about that today. We talked about triggers and integrated them into Cerner. I'll talk about that. We evaluated the sensitivity and specificity of the system and figured out, well, what's our baseline? How well are people doing before um, we set this up? We then trained our physicians and then we did a randomized control trial to say, does this clinical decision support system do what we want it to do? So what are the AAP guidelines that we were defining as what we wanted to measure? So I will tell you there are many other situations in which you probably should be getting head imaging, skeletal surveys, but we didn't want to make this controversial in terms of when you should do an evaluation. So we picked five scenarios in which the AAP has clear guidelines and that wasn't part of the controversy. For example, I said we do not have a four month old who's in a domestic dispute. Right? A four month old who comes to your ER after a domestic dispute, 
probably needs to get a skeletal survey, but the AAP doesn't have a specific statement on it, so we didn't put it in our list. So our list was if you have a non-cruising infant with a fracture, then you need to get a skeletal survey, CBC platelets, liver function tests, and calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, alkalos. Less than six months of age, if you have bruises, you need this evaluation, including von Willebrand's. I should say for the fracture, we did not include vitamin D or PTH, although most centers were going to do that as part of their evaluation. But again, we didn't include it because in an ER setting, a general ED, for example, would not do those. They would probably be transferring. So we tried to make this as generalizable as possible. Six to 12 months not yet cruising with a bruise that was in an area that you're not supposed to bruise. So if you fall off a, a table and you have a forehead bruise and you're eight months old, you don't need a child abuse evaluation. But if you have a bruise in these 10-4 regions, which is torso, ear, neck, frenulum, angle of jaw, cheek, eyelid, or sclera, that's a high-risk area, you do need a child abuse evaluation. Less than 12 months with an intracranial hemorrhage not due to a motor vehicle crash. Children less than two reported to Child Protective Services for concerns of physical abuse need a skeletal survey. So these are clear, we said this was not supposed to be controversial, which it wasn't. Following these guidelines, we should improve identification of abusive head trauma, partly because we're doing a child abuse evaluation in everybody with intracranial hemorrhage, not due, to a, not due to a motor vehicle crash, and some of these other injuries, a bruise, a child with four months old with a bruise should get a head CT. So we should pick up some abusive head trauma in there. So what do we do with these triggers? So we basically embedded triggers anywhere in the health record where there was a discrete field um, and it could be related to abuse. Um, there in pre-arrival documentation, for example, there's a, a box on our pre-arrival, has a child abuse or a child line already been filed on this child? If the answer is yes, it alerts. And you'd say like, well, why would you need that? Well, actually some of our biggest misses is when outside hospitals had concerns, but by the time the parents got to us, their story sounded really good and nobody was suspicious, right? So knowing that another hospital was concerned gives you a little pause before you say, oh, everything looks fine. Nursing documentation, I'm going to show you how this gets documented on their assessment form. Those are discrete fields. That will alert you. A chief complaint of a fracture in an infant, that will alert you. We only really need non-cruising infants, but there's no way to document the electronic health record. So an 11-month-old might have a toddler's fracture. It might alert, but you just have to say that's clinical judgment because we can't document their developmental level. And an x-ray order other than chest or abdomen, followed by an order for sedation medication, which is an interesting one that has worked quite well. So if the orthopedic comes down to cast the humerus fracture in the four-month-old, you will have the x-ray, followed by the sedation medications, also for femurs. Um, and that was a way to pick up kids that were not picked up other ways. Of course, these are all going to be under one year of age. Once you hit two, obviously the vast majority of fractures are not abuse. Children are walking, and so it becomes much different. So this is focused on very young children. So there's a total of 30 triggers, um, and they're all listed in the paper. Just, but just to show you, these are the discrete, discrete fields. So if they check ear condition bruising, that happens to be a field for us. Skin characteristics bruising. But if they write bruise around the eye, you will miss it. So we really did a lot of education for the nurses. This nurse did it both places. Um, but if you have text, we do not have text language processing in our hospital, or natural language processing, so it cannot read what the nurses write. In our general ADs, we do have natural language processing I'm going to show you because it's a different platform of Cerner. But here you had to check the box. So if this nurse checked this box of bruising in a four-month-old, when the physician opens the chart, they get an alert. These are all the chief complaints. Actually, when we started this, we reduced our chief complaints from 300 to 108. This was one of our fellows projects because the most common chief complaint was actually medical complaint because nobody wanted to like look through 300. Um, so we went it down to 108. Um, and we very intentionally included assault, scan, bruising, burn, petechiae, things that we wanted to make sure we included. Interesting, as we went down, almost every child now gets a specific complaint, and very rarely does it just say medical complaint, which has been really good for a lot of other people doing research because it allows them to actually look at chief complaints that mean something. Um, so, so we have it. The chief complaint can also result in a trigger. So, so what happened? So first we started by evaluating the sensitivity and specificity. This was back 2014 to 15. There were 226 children that triggered our system when we were what's called silent mode. Silent mode means we saw it as a research team, but it did not affect any clinical care. Nobody was getting anything. Because we had to work out some of the kinks. We found quite a few coding errors, ands that should have been ors, and other things that weren't specific that we thought would be. We thought, for example, closed head injury in a child less than six months. That should be concerning. It turns out that was used hundreds and hundreds of times and it was totally nonspecific. So we had to take it out as a trigger. So we used that opportunity during the silent mode to make changes to the coding itself. 
virtually all of the triggers got used at least once. And luckily, many patients actually had more than one trigger because no matter how much you educate, the nurses don't always document with a check. People don't always use a chief complaint you want. So it is a little bit of a redundant system, which is a good thing. So what did we see? So we compared the 226 kids who triggered to all the kids who were in our e less than two years old in our ER during that time period. Not surprisingly, there was no difference in gender, but importantly, there was no difference in the race of the children who triggered versus the children who didn't. So one of the big concerns is that we screen children who are African American more than children who are white with the same injuries. But when we looked at triggering, we did not see any difference in the triggering based on race. However, we did see a significant difference based on insurance, which does make sense because one of the very clear and known risk factors for abuse is poverty. Now, of course, most people who are poor don't abuse their children, but it is a very significant risk factor, particularly for physical abuse and neglect. So it's not surprising that the percent of children who are on Medicaid, which is 77% of the kids who triggered, was significantly higher than the children in our ER. And interestingly, people were worried about how many kids would trigger. It was actually 0.6% of all the kids in the ED, and it's very remarkably consistent with a little bit of a drop during flu season because then the denominator gets so big because you have so many kids with respiratory illnesses. But this was not a significant number of children. So how do we define sensitivity? So we define the sensitivity of how well do we pick up kids with physical abuse. True positives we define as kids classified by the child protection team as possible, probable, or definite abuse. And we made it very broad because you wouldn't want to only do skeletal surveys in children with definite abuse. So we decided to make it very broad who we were counting as a true positive. And then, of course, they had to meet one of the metrics. A false net negative was all children classified as having possible, probable, definite abuse who did not trigger the system. Specificity we defined as children who didn't trigger and were not abused. And I'll talk a little more about how we defined that. And false positives are children who triggered the system and whom you should never have evaluated for abuse. So we have to be very careful because you don't want this triggering all the time because obviously people will stop listening to it. So what did we see? So I said the reference standard was the child abuse team said possible, probable, or definite abuse. And then we were looking at whether the trigger fired. So we had 62 children who that we defined as having child abuse. Two of them did not trigger. Um, one of those children was a level one trauma who literally went from the ER to the OR without any documentation. Nobody would have missed that that child was abused. The other one interesting was a child with failure to thrive who went up to the floor and on the floor somebody got a skeletal survey because of the overlap between failure to thrive and abuse and there were healing fractures. So again, the ER, there was nothing they would have done. They wouldn't have done a skeletal survey and failure to thrive. So we felt pretty good about that. But what about the negative? So there were 166 kids who the child abuse team did not either did not consult or did not think were possible, probable, or definite, but fired the trigger. So if we look at those, in 45 of those cases, it was quite reasonable the physician would be worried about abuse. It just, it turned out that it wasn't abuse. But there were 73%, I'm sorry, in 45% it was unreasonable, the physician. In 73% it was reasonable. The ones that were unreasonable were almost all coding errors. So for example, on the chief complaint list, assault and asthma are right next to each other. So if the nurse clicks assault, the doctor opens the chart, even if the nurse goes back to realize, oh, I made a mistake, if the physician has opened the chart in the interim, it will trigger. So almost all of the unreasonable ones were coding errors where a chief complaint was incorrect or an order was put in and it was canceled. And I'm not sure there's too much you can do about those. But these other 73%, it was very reasonable. For example, a child with marijuana exposure, somebody would get a skeletal survey, it was negative. We didn't think it was physical abuse, it was just the marijuana exposure. It wasn't unreasonable, but it didn't define our reference standard. But then our biggest problem is we had 10,710 kids that the child protection team didn't know about and did not trigger. How do we know that was not filled with abuse kids that everybody missed? So we thought a lot about this, and we could have reviewed 10,710 charts, probably not reasonable. We could have reviewed a random selection of those charts. But actually, in the end, what we had decided to do was to review a non-random selection. And to non-random selection was kids who were particularly high risk of abuse in that true negative cohort. And what we defined that was is anybody the child protection team was consulted on, regardless of what we thought, in the year after this ran in the ER. So the idea is if we saw that kid any time in the year after, we would look back and see if there was a potential missed opportunity before. So there were 210 kids that were evaluated for us by 
for us for any reason in the subsequent 12 months. There was a total of 61 ED visits that occurred in that, um, in that group of 10,710. 59 out of 61 were unrelated to trauma, and there was clearly, it was just a kid with a flu who came back later abused. The two other were trauma, but were clearly not missed, missed opportunities. One was a nine-month-old who was going into foster care for poor housing, but still that would have triggered. And then the other one was a six-month-old with a, um, a, a bru single bruise to the forehead after a fall off a bed um, and came back at 11 months for a tooth injury which we did neither did we think was abused and we wouldn't have done anything differently. So this made us feel better. Obviously we can't say there wasn't any kid, but we thought this was a pretty good way to look at this. So we concluded that it's possible to embed these triggers. It should improve identification of abusive head trauma along with other types of abuse. There was a high sensitivity and specificity. The low specificity was acceptable to our physician uh, providers. Um, also, as I'm gonna show you, it's really easy to deactivate the pop-up if you don't need to use it. And so we moved on to the randomized controlled trial. But as I'm going to note, we hadn't yet calculated the baseline compliance rate at that time um, because we, hadn't, we didn't have the data to do it. So we then randomized at the level of the fin. The provider did or did not receive a pop-up based on the possibility of abuse. This is our study um, about what happened when we integrated this clinical decision support. So basically what happens when it's live, the patient sets off an alert. Um, the nurse gets a positive physical abuse order it tells them to undress the child and measure the head circumference, since we're gonna use that later to decide whether the child needs imaging. And a light bulb shows up on the alert system, which says that's our child abuse alert. Everybody knows that's child abuse. The doc received an alert, and the, based on the alert, they can either say yes and get the physical abuse power plan, say not now, which means next time they enter the chart, they'll get it, or no, never. If one person presses no, never, nobody will get the alert. A lot of discussion about that, and that's a whole discussion of how you decide whether other people should be able to extinguish the alert for everybody. This is an example of a physical abuse power plan. There are multiple sub-phases. You can have a bruise or petechiae in a child who's not cruising, a burn in a child who's not yet cruising, intracranial hemorrhage in a child not yet cruising, and you just click on the one that you want. This is the intracranial hemorrhage. Everything the AAP recommends and everything our trauma service wants is pre-checked and everything that requires some other decision, like abdominal CT, you first have to have AST or ALT to know, that's not pre-checked. We combine these with our trauma um, order set so that children only needed one order set. So what happened, there were no disasters, that's always a good thing. Um, people really liked the power plan. In fact, they liked the power plan so much that we saw no difference in the rate of power plan uses between our cases and controls. And remember, this was actually at the, the randomization had to be at the level of the patient. It could not be at the level of the provider because providers don't sign up for patients until after they come in and they basically already triggered. So the problem with doing it at the level of the patient is a provider could have one patient that triggers at the beginning of their shift and another one who doesn't. So basically once providers found out that the power plan existed, they always went and searched for it in the catalog, which was there, and then they used it. So from a clinical perspective, it was great. I don't think I've seen a skeletal survey not ordered from a power plan like in the last two years, um, but it was really bad for research because everyone just used the power plan. Um, in terms of our primary outcome, we also saw something that we did not expect, and again, not great for research, but great for clinical care. So when we started, we assumed that 70% of people would be compliant and that we'd be able to go to 90% with this. 70% was the top third of all of the children's hospitals in the pediatric health information system when they had looked at how people are following these guidelines. What we did not know is Children's Hospital happened to have been the top performing hospital in FIS, and we had no way to do that, and FIS told us that after this happened because we saw this data and said, like, this doesn't make any sense. This is too good. And they said, no, no, actually, this is where you've been. I kind of wish I had known that before, but at the same time, I wouldn't have done the study because I would have realized we couldn't improve it. So again, great for kids in Pittsburgh, not so great for research. Because we found that before we started, 78% of people were fully compliant in infants less than 12 months of age with a fracture. 100% of people were compliant with infants with intracranial hemorrhage. So although we did increase a little bit, none of this was, was, was uh, significant. We would have had to continue forever and ever, and we wouldn't have seen anything because everybody was using all the power plans. Um, so overall, we were 87% compliant in our pre-intervention period. So good for children of Pittsburgh, bad for looking at whether something changes. That said, if we had taken this away, our physicians would have revolted. They really like getting these pop-ups. They wanted to continue to get the pop-ups, the alerts. So the system, as we have set it up, um, is still there and has been there since 2015.
So did it help identify abusive head trauma? Probably indirectly. The person, people who would help the most was our non-pediatric residents, and that's why our attendings liked it, because the non-pediatric residents don't usually think of abuse, but here it was popped up in their face and they did have to think about it. Um, and it may have improved bruises and fracture identification, but it is hard to measure. So we thought this was quickly accepted. If they used the order set, they were always fully compliant. They didn't leave anything out. And we really knew we had to go to hospitals with lower compliance rates. But I want to just briefly touch on general EDs. The rate of missed abuse is higher there. About 80% of kids are not seen in a pediatric hospital. Um, and so we knew we wanted to go into our general EDs, but there are no discrete fields in the platform of Cerner on our general ED side. So we have 20 general EDs that use Cerner that are part of the UPMC hospital system. So we did, we started routine electronic health record, uh, routine screening of child abuse within the electronic health record. I think we are the first hospital system to do this. We are still doing it. Um, and we use the screening tool from the Netherlands, which is the best of the screens. None of these screens are perfect. None of them are perfectly validated, but we used what we thought was the best one. Um, and basically it helps to recognize red flag clinical features. It's five, sir, five questions completed by the nurse. It really has to be mandatory for all children. You can't just do it in kids with trauma or you're gonna end up missing a lot of kids. Um, and we decided to do it less than 13 because at 13, under the age of 13, there is no sexual activity that is legal in Pennsylvania. So at the age of 13, the nurses have to do a domestic violence screen. And under 13, they were willing to do the child abuse screen because before, they were filling out multiple check boxes about why they weren't there doing the domestic violence screen. So as a pragmatic thing, we didn't have to increase any click boxes for nurses, but they felt like this was a lot better than clicking boxes about why they weren't screening for domestic violence. This is our tool. Um, you can find it basically asks, does the child have bruises? Is there a delay in seeking care? Are you worried? Um, and what we found in our adult hospitals is basically we had 68% of the kids were screened. So it's mandatory, but not a hard stop, right? So 68% is actually even better than most of their other screens. So that was actually pretty good. Um, so 68% of the kids that were positive, or kids that were screened, 1.9% were positive. <laughs> this has been fairly stable and actually quite similar to the Netherlands. So 1.9% were positive. And then what's interesting is, of the kids that were positive, half resulted in a child line, or a child abuse report, which is good. It means people were not screening positive and just instinctively reporting all of them. Importantly, if you did not screen, basically nobody ever reported to Child Protective Services, which is a little disturbing. So it did clearly increase reports. We didn't see an increase in ridiculous reports. People did think about this. Um, so the takeaways were about half of reports, positive screens led to report, and they almost never reported if they didn't screen. So probably we're, we're doing some good there. Just to tell you, our adult hospital, they have an alert as well, a little bit different than ours. This is their subphases. It's different because it was developed by our general EDs, which are not trauma centers, and focus much more on when to transfer. The important one we also added was, this subphase is meant to be used when an infant less than 12 months has a history of being shaken. I don't think it would ever occur to us if somebody came in with a video of a child being shaken who was three months old that you wouldn't get brain imaging. But we saw it in our general EDs. And so we added this subphase to specifically help them. And I will tell you, as probably your child abuse team knows, with videos and all this Facebook stuff, it is not that infrequent that people bring in videos of them seeing other children being shaken. And so we put this in there with a very specific intention of improving diagnosis. And there's also one for intracranial hemorrhage. And basically that says, if you have an infant with intracranial hemorrhage, transfer to a trauma center. So our hope was that we would improve diagnosis of abusive head trauma by getting the kids out of the general ADs, basically. So what can be used to supplement child abuse screening there? This is where I would just want to mention that we did look at using natural language processing in our general EDs um, through this rule-driven trigger system. We could not use discrete fields. They don't have them. This is just shows you what kind of things we did for natural language processing. This is really complicated and actually got better over time. So any of the words in the chief complaint, a child less than 12 months, assault, a bruise, bruise, and then actually bruise spelled incorrectly, sprain and sprain spelled incorrectly, do not trigger if it's preceded by denied, not, no. And you can see that over time, we got better. And there are things like it turned out there was a Dr. Burns in our system. And every time Dr. Burns refuted a system, it would pop up, right? So a, a, we had like broken, and then a parent spoke broken English, and that triggered. So over time, every six months, we are allowed to update this to bring in things that are better. And it is far more accurate now. And this is in the paper that we published. 
So the most important thing from this study, which I want to show you, is what happened when we put this clinical decision support system in our general EDs. And what we saw was in the pre-intervention period, which was nine months, there were only 10 children that met any of those AAP guidelines. When we put all these systems in place, 44 children were identified during exactly the same time period. So we quadrupled the number of children that we identified infants with bruises, infant with intracranial hemorrhage, just by having these triggers and the child abuse screen. It was a little bit scary insofar as once we had all of these triggers in place, all of a sudden their compliance rate dropped dramatically. Because at the beginning, when they only had like 10 kids, they were the most injured kids. And of course they were getting a skeletal survey. Well, they were in 64% of the cases, right? But the numbers are small. And then all of a sudden we increased to 44 the number of kids, and all of a sudden their compliance is now 30% because they're not doing anything. So it was good because we started to identify these high-risk kids that were being missed, but getting them to be compliant even today is extremely difficult. And that's a topic of an entire other grand rounds. So adult generally DDOCs do not like to use order sets. That's the only way to put it. And they're actually paying them now to use the sepsis order sets. That's how bad it is. So this is very problematic. So I think in the general EDs, I think we really did do something because we identified more fractures and bruises and we got them to transfer them to children's if nothing else and then we did the brain imaging. Um, and the subphase related to infants who were shaken also helped. We picked up at least two or three children where they had injuries, um, where they would not have screened. But still very challenging. But now I want to move to, these are all very broad. So how do we move into a clinical prediction rule that's very much going to focus on abusive head trauma? And then we're going to talk about biomarkers, again, also focused on brain. So this is the Pittsburgh Infant Brain Injury Score, which we validated in a multicenter prospective study. And this is specifically trying to identify children who need brain imaging to look for intracranial injury. So we looked at, basically we took, first we derived a clinical prediction rule using children we had enrolled in other studies. And we identified variables which seemed to be associated in these high-risk children with having a brain injury, having a big head, having a decreased hemoglobin, being older than three months but less than a year, which you might say, like, that doesn't make sense. It really does because actually by three months of age, you don't have colic anymore, so fussy, this is on issue. You don't have pyloric stenosis anymore. So once you're older than three months, the rule gets better. Of course, a lot of the abuse of head trauma is in those younger kids, but for this rule, that's a predictor an abnormality on your dermatologic or neurologic exam, which I'll talk a little bit more about, or a previous ED visit for another high-risk visit. So this was our prospective validation. These were our inclusion criteria. You had to be less than one. You had to look well. Again, if you don't look well, we're not going to miss abuse of head trauma. You had to be afebrile. You can't have a history of trauma as the reason you come in. Parents always later get a reason, but that's okay. Um, and then they have to be seeking care for apnea, vomiting, seizures, bruising, or other nonspecific um, symptoms. The only exclusion was they came in for history of trauma or they had prior abnormal imaging. So we had basically all comers. We collected all of our data. We prospectively collected the physical exam data by handing the physicians a piece of paper because as you know, the medical record just says everything is normal. Um, so we did that prospectively. And just note here, we did blood collection because as I'm going to talk about, we also prospectively validate biomarkers as part of this. So we had 1,040 infants enrolled. The average age was four months. Um, they presented for basically all the reasons we were looking for, which is good. Um, almost 80% were controls, 20% were cases. I should say we don't, this is not to say that the prevalence is 20%, but if children were found to have a brain injury before we approached them for the study, we had a waiver of informed consent. So there's gonna be more kids there with a head injury because we got all of those children. Um, 100 of the 214 had probable or definite abusive head trauma, 50 had possible, but if you look at the other one, there are other kids, so there are not everybody who has an intracranial hemorrhage is an abuse patient. We looked at all of our variables from our derivation. All of them were highly significant prior ED visits, and we think what happened was basically urgent care centers kind of evolved in these three years, and we just had no way to account for them, that kids were going to EDs, were now going to urgent cares, we didn't have data from the prior urgent cares, so that whole variable fell out. The three sites were virtually identical to each other, which is always good, one was Salt Lake City, one was Chicago, one was Pittsburgh, so that's good, very different populations, and the cutoffs were virtually identical to the derivation. So again, that's good, because it shows it's a robust rule. 
This is the ultimate score. You get a, two points for a bruise or something like that, one point for your age, one point for your head circumference, one point for your hemoglobin. The age, the, the thing that Dermalogic turned out to be two is very nice because that's consistent with the AAP recommendations. If you have a four month old with a bruise, you should be getting head imaging. So we didn't do it intentionally, but in the end it was consistent with the AAP. This is our receiver operator curve. Our area under the curve is 0.83, which is really good for a prospective multicenter validation. And the question is, when is the rule the most accurate? At a score of three, it was 80% sensitive, 75% specific. Of course, you could lower your score to two, and then you're 93% sensitive, but you're only 50% specific. So you kind of have to descend. My argument would be, as we're going to talk about, if your screening test is a fast MRI, I would use two. If your screening test is a CT, you probably want to think more about two or three. It really depends on what you're doing as your next step. So how close is this to clinical practice? We've done our derivation, our validation. We have not done our implementation impact analysis because what you really need to know is can, if you integrate it, what happens? Do people get a pop-up that says your score is zero, we don't recommend an image, and they're like, oh my God, I hadn't even thought about head injury. I think I should get an image even though the score is zero. So we don't know what would happen. We just got funding to do this, um, and we're going to look at whether the, the rule increases the use of neuroimaging. So we concluded we had good sensitivity and specificity. The der derivation was very similar. And I think at this point, we don't have our implementation, but it's at least worth calculating the score um, and think about it. We still have kids miss where their hemoglobin is seven and they're vomiting and people don't think about head injury as a possible etiology. So I think at least the components of it give you at least something to think about. But of course, you still need clinical judgment. So at the time we were doing PIBIS, we were also looking at biomarkers. And this is a busy slide, but it's really just to show you that when the brain is injured, there is a huge and massive response of lots and lots of biomarkers, none of which are specific to abusive head trauma, but they are for brain injury. And so this is a brief run through, partly because I, I said I started doing this and then I thought, oh my God, this has been a really long haul. We started looking at CSF, we started looking at non-abuse, and I just want to show you these papers started in 2002. And of course, you guys know you can't actually measure biomarkers in clinical care yet, so we're 18 years later. Just shows you the bench to the bedside is really, really long. Um, so these were our initial studies. Then we first looked at serum NSC, S100 and MBP. This was part of my K award. This was our first serum study, and this suggested, yes, serum biomarkers might work, even in well-appearing children. And then we started trying to expand our panel because we wanted some non-brain specific markers. We, I'm highlighting the ones in red that we ended up pursuing later, VCAM, interleukin-6, and MMP9. Um, again, we were trying to get more biomarkers because we knew we wanted to put together a panel. I mean, the brain is too complicated to have one biomarker, so we knew we wanted to put together a panel. And then we spent a few more years with some really cool markers, but it turned out they were under patent protection, so it became really difficult to actually use them, so we had to kind of get rid of those, but that was a few years there. And then we finally were able to publish our biomarkers of infant brain injury score. And this is the validation of what we call BIBIS, the biomarkers of infant brain injury score. And what is in here? There were actually four markers initially in here. Um, these three plus interleukin-6. We ultimately had to remove interleukin-6 actually completely due to a technological issue. The concentrations of interleukin-6 are so high in the serum relative to these other ones that any type of um, Immuno, chemoimmunofluorescence we were using, it would overwhelm the concentrations of all the other biomarkers. It's kind of like if you make an MMR vaccine, there, you can't make an MMR IPV. Like, you can't always combine all things together because they interact with each other. So it turned out that interleukin-6 could not be combined with the other biomarkers in a way that we could measure them, so we removed it. And the three biomarkers we ended up with were MMP9, neuron-specific enolase, and VCAM. Interesting with VCAM, VCAM is much, much higher in CSF in people with brain injury. It's actually much lower in serum. And we're not entirely sure why, but it's very, very consistent. So we had the same criteria for BIBIS. It's the same study as for PIBIS. We collected our biomarkers. They processed by our hospital lab. We defrosted, aliquoted, measure, measured a hemocube because you need to look at the level of hemolysis when you're measuring neuron specific enolase. And we shipped them to Excello, which is a company in Toronto that had the machine that essentially measured these biomarkers. And then we measured them simultaneously on what they called the Ziplex system. 
So there were 560 patients in that 1,000 cohort that had serum that we could use. We couldn't use plasma for this. Some kids didn't have enough. In the end, we ended with 561. And this is kind of where they all fell out. They had skull fractures, abusive head trauma, intracranial hemorrhage not due to abuse, chronic intracranial hemorrhage. But I wanted to point out those 38 kids. We were very worried with Bibis that we naturally, with this many kids, we weren't going to get kids with strokes. We weren't going to get kids with tumors because those are so rare that even in this cohort we wouldn't get them. So we intentionally got 38 children with diseases that were so rare that we wouldn't be able to pick them out anyway and put them into the cohort so we could look at the sensitivity and specificity for these non-traumatic insults that are really rare. This was our ROC curve. I always say the most depressing part of all this is hemoglobin is better than any of these biomarkers which is why I say look at your hemoglobin. It is better than any. The other ones add a lot to it, but hemoglobin is the best of them. Overall, our interesting area of the curve is identical to the pivot area into the curve, but again, this is prospective. The sensitivity was 86%, specificity is 55%, very similar to pivot actually, um, and the sensitivity for kids who ultimately had abusive head trauma was 92%. So these work from a scientific perspective. This is the very fancy formula you use to put together to get it. Um, but the problem is actually getting these from bench to the bedside. In the lab, we use ELISAs to measure things. You c in ELISAs, you can only measure like, uh, you have, with every sample you measure, you've got to have your controls and your standards, and you can measure one biomarker. You can't use that in clinical care. Even multiplex B technology, you can measure lots of biomarkers together, but still you can't measure one patient sample. You've always got to have your standards and controls, which is not really useful in a clinical setting. And the other problem is the interkit or the inter group variability is very high, which obviously is not acceptable in clinical practice. So if we want to put this into a CLIA certified lab, you have to be around a single patient. You have to, can't wait and batch everyone together. You have to have very little variability, and it can't be user dependent. ELISAs are user dependent. You stand there with a pipette. So the path from one to the other is not that straightforward. I said when we did the Bibis study, we froze the samples, we shipped them to Excella. They measured it in this kind of device on this research tip ship. This company, um, Excella, has now been bought by a European company called Angle, which is an in vitro diagnostics company. Um, and ultimately, they're kind of looking at something that looks like this thing, and they're trying to automate it. This is kind of what they look like. Um, ultimately, you want a point of care, which is this kind of thing. We are very, very far from a point of care. Even the military hasn't gotten to a point of care. This turns out to be a lot harder than any of us would have liked. So in the end, the issue with the biomarkers is not really focused on do they work. They do work. It's focused on the platform, but also, interestingly, on patent issues. So you can no longer patent a biomarker. That was a decision based on BRCA1 by the Supreme Court. You can only patent what's called a kit claim, the biomarkers on a device. So we currently have a pending patent for these biomarkers measured on the Ziplex system, which is owned by Engel. Um, but that's a very long process <laughs> to get from one to the other. And this is also a new diagnostic without a precedent. We don't have biomarkers. So what do you compare to? Do you compare to clinical judgment? Do you compare to CTing everybody? The FDA isn't quite sure what the precedent should be. So we have this provisional patent. It's co-owned by the University of Pittsburgh and Engel, which is also a weird situation because either of us can walk away with any of it and not collaborate with the other person because we both equally own it, which is very odd. Um, so basically, we're at the point where we are still trying to develop this and get it to what the European equivalent of the FDA is, because Engel is actually a European company. Um, but it is a long and arduous task. And I want to end with the fact that all of these screening tests lead to neuroimaging. But we have to recognize one of the biggest barriers is people don't like to CT infants for very good reasons. Um, but that leads to missed abusive head trauma. So over the last few years, we've been trying to do figure out whether we could develop a screening MRI that could be used to replace head CT. So the first paper was our development of the screening MRI. I'm going to talk about it. And then actually last month, we published the implementation of this. So when we developed it, we used a cohort of infants with abusive head trauma who all had MRI and CT. And we basically looked at every single sequence. The radiologist looked blind. It was this positive, it was negative. So we had this massive spreadsheet of every single sequence. Was it positive or negative in all these kids? and we developed a sequence. We said these three sequences picked up 100% of these kids. We then validated it in 78 infants with and without head trauma. Again, it was 
100% sensitive. It wasn't 100% specific because sometimes the radiologist is like, I'm not sure if that's positive or negative. Um, you guys can have these slides, by the way, I've taken pictures. Um, so then the question was, could you do this in a busy ED? Can the infant stay still long enough? It's a six minute um, MRI. And then the other question we had was, can you replace a conventional axial T2 with a quick, the SSFE? Um, because of course, kids who had a full MRI would not have had the shot, the fast spin because they had a full MRI. Um, and then we actually added an axial DWI. I think we were concerned enough that we could potentially miss a stroke with that other one. The DWI is only 50 seconds and stroke is so rare, we would never, we would not pick it up like in a, a small cohort. So the paper we just published is 158 children who had a fast MRI as part of clinical care. These kids did not have a head CT. The providers were comfortable just ordering their fast MRI. 98% of them sat still through the six minutes with a high quality scan. Um, of those, 9% were abnormal. And importantly, 94% of those kids only needed that MRI. They never had to get a subsequent CT or a subsequent sedation for a full MRI. What was unanticipated is some of these scans were so good that our neurosurgeons were like, I don't need anything else, because we're like, do you want to get a full? And they're like, no. Um, particularly the kids with chronic subdurals. MRI is actually much better than CT for telling what's a chronic subdural and what's benign extraaxial fluid of infancy. So this is actually done much better. We do very little CTing, um, except children that are really injured. If you have a child covered with bruises, lots of fractures, we're worried about um, those kids. We will get a head CT. And the axial SSFE and the conventional work basically always congruent. So we were able to shorten the time of our um, protocol. This is our current protocol. If the patients are not moving, we go on and almost get a full MRI. About 30% of our kids were able to move on and get other sequences. Importantly, you have to have a skeletal survey. If you're doing a fast MRI, the radiologist will not start the protocol till they see the fast MRI because you will miss skull fractures on MRI, which you would not miss on CT. So that's really, really important. And the reason I think it's interesting is that was actually what they found in this study by Dan Lindbergh and his colleagues, which was published, ironically, at almost the same month that we did. And I knew they were doing this study. They looked at fast MRI and TBI. They had 225 kids, same with us. They were able to do almost all of them. They had many more abnormals. So their kids had CT and MRI. Fast MRI missed isolated skull fractures. So I think the idea of fast MRI being used for trauma or anything else is really moving forward. But we do have to recognize the limitations of MRI is missing skull fractures and potentially subarachnoid hemorrhage. We don't get rid of that by doing a fast MRI. So although we don't like to think about money, um, more screening leads to more evaluations and more detection, but also you're gonna get more negative evaluations. So I just think this is kind of interesting. This is one of our fellows who actually, this is in, in revision at Journal of Pediatrics. She actually started looking at what is the best strategy from a cost effectiveness standpoint in an ED with no access to fast MRI. She compared clinical judgment to universal head CT to the Pittsburgh Infant Brain Injury for score followed by CT. In EDs with access to fast MRI, clinical judgment versus universal CT versus universal fast MRI versus PIBIS followed by fast MRI. To try to start looking at which is the most cost effective thing. And of course, there are lots of assumptions. You have to assume the risk of abuse of head trauma in the population, the risk of recurrent abuse of head trauma, the sensitivity and specificity of CTs, what's the sensitivity and specificity of PIBIS. So you put all of this into this Markov modeling. But it's still an interesting practice because, I guess, sorry, the other assumptions is misdiagnosis leads to re injury, and that has a poor outcome. We follow these cohorts for a year. So just I think is an interesting finding. In EDs with no fast MRI, PIBIS by CT is by far the most cost effective. Um, EDs with fast MRI, universal fast MRI actually turns out to be more cost effective followed closely by the PIBIS followed by fast MRI. These were both far cheaper in terms of quality life than clinical judgment, which makes us all feel good that quality, that clinical judgment is not the most cost effective thing, which we know because we missed a lot of cases of abuse. The one thing I have to be clear is you never can include the costs of child protective services or legal intervention because as soon as you do, it actually becomes never cost effective to ever identify child abuse. And that's a real ethical dilemma. So all of these studies, not just hers, but the other ones have left out social services because the cost is so astronomic. So in conclusion, abusive head trauma is a leading cause of morbidity and mortality from physical abuse and TBI. There are multiple ways that we can decrease the rate, I think, of abusive head trauma being missed. All of these seem to provide improvement over clinical judgment. And I think the specific strategies that any given hospital should use or are most effective really depends on a lot of factors within a hospital. 
Can you integrate things into your electronic health record in a good way? If you have Cerner or Epic, those are much more user friendly than Sunrise, which is a very difficult electronic health record to code in, and we've tried. Um, do you guys have Sunrise? Yeah. Okay. So let me, I will tell you another time, because we, we are live in Northwell for the past year, which is Northwell Health Systems, which is Sunrise, um, and also access to MRI. So that's another issue. So I think there are different ways to approach it. I didn't realize it was Sunrise. I should have known that before. That's a whole. Okay, so which of the following? The answer is we've evaluated all of these. And I think we always, I want to end with why we care about this. This is from the Miami Herald. If you haven't read this article, you should. It won a Pulitzer. These are photos, and there's pages and pages of all these children that died of abuse, of, of child abuse, who were known to Child Protective Services or to the medical system and still died. Um, and it's, it's a really fabulous, uh, this article is incredibly well done. So I just want to thank everybody on our IT team, the UPMC general team, our research team, Pecori and Beckwith Institute that have funded a lot of this, and my team at the Child Advocacy Center. So thank you. Thank you.